welcome to a book review that I haven't done one in a really long while because you guys know about the reading slump that I've been having this past year. But what a wonderful way to break this reading slump by reading Lady Midnight by Cassandra Clare. This was such a good book to get me out of my reading slump. I, I think this is just what I've been waiting for and I am now wanting to devour all the books again because Cassandra Clare just, you know, does that to people. This is going to be a book review full of spoilers because there's really no way around it and there's so much to talk about that I have to talk about this book in detail, in depth. And so I would recommend that before you read this book, you should definitely, definitely read The Mortal Instruments and The Infernal Devices because they play such a pivotal role in this book. And so I highly recommend that you read those before you pick this up. I super, super love all of Cassandra Clare's books, and so I just always recommend them. I so far like The Infernal Devices a little bit better, but this has a lot of potential, and so if you want to stay and do all the uh, spoilers, you should stay, and I have a very crockpot theory that I'll be discussing at the end. Um, if you haven't read it, then I highly suggest that you stop watching it here and just know that it's fabulous and wonderful and to go and read it. So goodbye non spoilerly people, and this is your last chance before you're going to regret it. So... Yes. So to all the lovely people that stayed, hello, it's nice to see you again. Welcome to my dome where I am going to be discussing Lady Midnight in depth and it's going to be wonderful and stay tuned at the very end because it's, everything needs to be explained before I get to the very end where I have my major crockpot theory that I don't think that it's going to actually happen, but I'm kind of curious that it might. So right off the bat in the prologue, we are introduced to this new character, Kit. And I remember jotting down uh, on page four, Kit sees Jem and Tessa. So I was super excited because it mentions that he saw a lady with brown hair and glasses and a guy with brown hair and a streak of silver. So I was really excited to see Jem and Tessa really early on, made me wonder what they were there for. Maybe they were at the LA Institute to help with uh, Emma. I just didn't know, but I was really excited to see them right off the bat and kind of sad that they didn't play a more pivotal role throughout the beginning of the book because I was really looking forward to seeing them. But we're introduced to Kit, who we have no idea who he really is. We know his dad is Johnny Rook, and there's this supernatural market, and Kit has the sight, but we don't really know much other than that. It is mentioned at the end of the prologue, though, that someone says to Kit that my biggest secret is you. So automatically makes you start thinking, who is this Kit? But then we're thrown into the world of Emma and Julian and this whole Blackthorn Carstairs world that we kind of forget about the whole dilemma with Kit and who he really is. However, on a side note, when you see the name Kit, I just automatically picture him as Kit Harrington, and I'm not going to complain with that. Within being thrown into this Blackthorn world that we have come to know and love and love every single one of the characters, which is also something that Cassandra Clare did really nicely, is that each of the characters, from the main characters to the side characters, they were all developed really well. And you got to really know and understand them and feel for them in their own ways. But one of the things that really makes you feel for Jules is that at the age of 12, with Helen sent to the island and Mark taken away to the hunt, at the age of 12, he had to take care of his younger siblings, and he did everything. And so you know that there's just so much pressure on him, and he's not like his old, like an older brother to his siblings anymore. He's more of a parent, and you really feel that responsibility with him. All right, this is going to be a little bit of a touchy subject, but let's talk about the bond between Emma and Jules. I see friendship 
I didn't really see a connection personally between their relationship. I don't know what it was or why, I can't really put my finger on it, but I just didn't really feel a lot of chemistry or romantic connection. Um, on top of that, the whole writing on each other thing, like, okay, girls, I don't know if guys really do it, but girls, we've all been there, you know, drawn each other's backs. So oh, what does this say? It takes a while. I feel like in the pace that you're reading, it feels like it goes a lot faster, but in reality, it takes a lot longer than what actually happens. So sometimes the way that they're communicating, even if it's, you know, in the palm of their hand or something like that, that looks a little bit couply. So I think that would raise an eyebrow, right? But on top of that, it just takes, it takes a while. Like, where are you going? It's gonna take a little bit than just, you know, whispering it or something. So I don't really understand how that really works, but, you know, we'll roll with it. We're introduced to Malcolm, and right off the bat, I think everyone really loved Malcolm. Here we are in this world where we just come off of Magnus Bane, and Magnus is wonderful, and he's really been the only warlock, I guess besides Tessa, that we've really had a sit-down kind of feel with them and that we really know them. And then here's Malcolm. So we, I think we all expected to really love him and we, he is this romantic person and he wants to watch Notting Hill. And so I think we found him all very relatable and that's why I don't think anyone expected him to be the bad guy in the end. I do remember thinking that like, it was weird how Malcolm didn't really have any progression as the case unfolded. But at the same time, I just had my trust in him, and I was just like, he's just gonna come with something, and he's gonna, just gonna solve it all, and it'll be great and fantastic. But, um, well, we all see how that turned out. While we're on the topic of Malcolm, I don't think he's dead. I don't believe it. And I don't think anyone else out there believes it, because if we know Cassandra Clare, we did not see a body, there is no proof, he is still out there somewhere with that black book. One of the things that surprised me right off the bat is how fast we we're introduced to Mark. I was expecting some kind of build up and for him to show maybe in the middle towards the end of the book. But basically we're thrown into Emma and Julian's world and then all of a sudden Mark and the fairies come by. And it was just one of those things where I wasn't expecting Mark so soon, but I was glad that it happened the way that it did because you really got to understand Mark as a character and he became one of the main characters and it was really great having kind of that perspective uh, from his point of view of the hunt and being a shadow hunter and his conflicting emotions about being both. You also just have such, or at least me, I have such a sadness for Mark in the sense of you know kind of what he missed out on and then when he was introduced back it had been five years time for you know since he last saw them it's just one of those things where he didn't even recognize him it took him a while to kind of remember how to function as a human being and not a fairy um, so along the way that was hilarious uh, of coming down and dressed in just the, the fur coat and told you not to trust Tyre Livy and definitely learned the hard way. We're also introduced to Christina, who I love. I really liked the balance between um, Christina and Emma because they really balance each other out well. There's just different yin and yangs that really mesh well together as well as they have a lot of similarities. Christina mentions earlier in the book that she wishes that Emma didn't have a pair of a tie with Julian or else Christina really would have liked to have one with Emma and Emma kind of says yeah or at least thinks that she could see it if she wasn't already a pair of a tie with Jules. I'm also a huge shipper of Mark and Christina. I want them to be together forever and just because I think we're predispositioned not to really like fairies because of the other previous books that there was already kind of a hatred of fairies or distrust of fairies from the reader's point of view which I think kind of inhibited me from really liking the Mark and Kieran relationship. Which then brings us to Diego. I don't trust him. I, I, I'm not buying what he's selling to Christina. I'm not buying it. He could have said something. 
This had been going on for years between his brother and Christina, and they were almost going to be a pair of a tie. So it's just one of those things to where I'm I'm not buying what he's selling, and he can go out and sell it at some other market because I I. I don't trust him. I don't trust him at all. There was a point where I thought Diana and Diego were in leagues together because they were never around at the same time and just things kind of, you don't really trust either of them. And Diana has some secret that hasn't been revealed yet, but we do know that she is on the Blackthorn side, or at least that's what we, we think. I didn't really trust Diana, but I thought it would be too close to the Hodge story to have Diana kind of be the bad person, but I thought that she would somehow play a role, which is still kind of true. While she didn't play the role of this villain, then we still don't know her secret, so we still don't know what her angle is. However, the fact that she did go to try to save Tabby all by herself was very heroic and I don't think it's something that she would have done if she didn't care for the children. So I don't think it's anything that'll harm the Blackthorns, at least intentionally. But I'm interested to see if that secret's going to be revealed in the next book. One of the things that I always see in books is that the bad guys are just they have to explain everything before they actually do it. There's no actually doing the action and then explaining it. I mean, that would probably be better for the bad guy, right? Like, if they actually did it and then maybe explain afterward. Um, but, you know, because good always ends up winning, then it stalls and creates time and yada yada yada. But I love how it's almost in every single book, the bad guy has to explain what he's doing before he actually does it, which ends up being their downfall. And the reason why I'm putting bad guy in quotations is, at least with Cassandra Clare's books, each of the villains have a sympathetic side and they're multi-dimensional, which is what I really like about her villains, is you kind of, in a weird way, you feel bad for them. And it just makes the fact that evil people are still people. I think it was mentioned in the book, I can't remember who said it, but someone said along the lines of nobody thinks that they're the villain in their own story. Everyone kind of thinks that they're the victim. And I thought that was really interesting and I think it sums up Sandra Clare's characters very well in the sense of you understand where they're coming from. So one of the interesting character developments I think about Jules is that he will do whatever it takes for him to help his family and there's something dark in him and even Kieran comments about it to Jules and says you know your brother thinks of you as a gentle soul but you are fierce. And I think near the end, there was a thing that didn't sit well with me, which is going to lead to my crackpot theory in just a few seconds, right? Is when Nightshade or Anselm or whatever his name was, the vampire that was friends of Uncle Arthur, he deliberately set up Anselm so that way his family and uh, Arthur would seem like he was more in control of the Institute than what he really was in order to protect his family and keep everyone together. It just didn't sit well with me because this vampire dude had been helping Arthur with his medicine and it was just a cold-blooded betrayal. We see that there is this dark brooding side to Jules. So the last thing to make my theory complete is we need to talk about Kit. Kit is Christopher Herondale. We discover this in the sense from Kit's point of view um, after the warlock was completely dead, he, all the, the runes and all of his spells vanished. It left them in danger of whatever Kit's father was doing. So, all of a sudden demons come in, tear his father apart, and then he's kind of dodging demons like no one's business. And that was my first kind of thought of is he a shadow hunter? Bringing me back to the beginning of his best kept secret. So is he a shadow hunter? And then Tessa and Jem walk in and basically mention that he's Christopher Herondale and my mind just exploded and I was just probably sat there reading that over and over again being like, no wait, what what is going on here? So basically Kit is a Herondale 
and he is now going to live in the Institute, and it seems that Jem and Emma are going to help Kit become a shadow hunter. All right, so now for the crackpot theory. Jem mentioned at the very end that a romantic partnership between Parabatai is a bad thing because then there are runes and they can start exhibiting um, powers like warlocks and that eventually it'll drive them to madness. I don't think Jules is going to end up being a good character. I think he is going to be a bad guy. Now, I know you're looking at me strangely and wondering how I came about this conclusion, so hear me out. At the end, in the epilogue, Annabelle wakes up. Don't know how. Now, I might have missed it, um, but I don't remember any mention of Blackthorn blood being spilled or anyone being scratched or anything like that. Sure, it could have happened and maybe it'll come out later that someone was accidentally you know, cut and just didn't think it was a big deal or something. Don't know. But my crackpot theory is that basically Jules and Emma, while they haven't explicitly said that they were in love each other, their love was requited for five years, ever since they became Parabatai. And so through that time could lead the male character, Jules, to become mad and, as as Jem had stated, because I do feel like there was such a difference in Jules within the first part of the book and the last part of the book. And as no one feels like they're the victim or the, the, the enemy in their own story, um, I have a feeling that maybe since they can have now special powers like warlocks. Maybe after Emma broke up with him, it was the straw on the camel's back. And maybe he went back to the place and spilled his blood. And because now that he could technically do that because he has blackthorn blood and because he possesses magic like a warlock. I don't know. I don't know what his motive would be in that. Maybe to reunite more Blackthorns or to get more help in the Institute. I don't know. So let's just play with this idea, right? So if Jules ends up being an evil character, um, who's to say that Emma would stay Parabatai with him? She could become Parabatai with Christina. I don't know who Emma would choose romantically. I don't know if she would stay with Jules or, I don't know for feeling's sake, if Emma would then start a romantic relationship with Kit. I don't know if Cassandra Clare would want to play on our Carstairs and Herondale love of each other. Um, so I don't know if Emma and Kit are maybe going to get together. I don't know if she'll stay with Jules. But my crackpot theory is that Jules is going to head down a slope of evil and then it'll be up to Emma to save him either as a pair of a tie or as a romantic partnership. Um, so that's my crackpot theory because right now Malcolm is dead. In the other series after the first book it didn't it didn't have really a conclusion that the villain was dead. There was still this progressive of that person is still out there so I don't think we've found the main villain of the series yet. Which, I don't know, makes me interested in maybe that it's Jules and that something is going to happen with this romantic Parabatai relationship. Don't know. That's my crackpot theory. Let me know if you think I might be on the wrong track. Let me know if you think my crackpot theory is just complete and utter bullocks. Because it could be. It probably is. But the thought did cross my mind and I thought I'd share it and have it on video in case it's right. So that is it for today. I know I just barely touched on stuff and there's just so much more, but to stop this from being a million ages long, I had to pick and choose what I wanted to talk about. But I would love to talk to you guys about it down below in the about section. So leave a comment and let's just start a conversation about my Lady Midnight because I'm in love. 
If you like my videos, please subscribe to my channel. You can also follow me on Goodreads and Twitter, and those links will be down below in the about section as well. And yes, I hope to talk to you guys soon, and I'll see you later, and yeah, I'm just looking forward to your comments. So let's start a discussion. Okay, bye! Hello, and welcome to my Bring It On Books for March, which is going to be really short because there's only one book, and I think people might know what that